War and Peace, Book One, Chapter Eighteen, read for LibriVox.org by Gemma Blythe. Countess Rostova, with her daughters and a large number of guests, was already seated in the drawing room. The count took the gentlemen into his study and showed them his choice collection of Turkish pipes. From time to time he went out to ask, "Hasn't she come yet?" They were expecting Maria Dmitrievna Akrozimova known in society as the terrible dragon a lady distinguished not for wealth or rank but for common sense and frank plainness of speech maria dmitrievna was known to the imperial family as well as to our moscow and petersburg and both cities wondered at her laughed privately at her rudenesses and told good stories about her while none the less all without exception respected and feared her in the count's room which was full of tobacco smoke they talked of war that had been announced in the manifesto and about the recruiting none of them had yet seen the manifesto but they all knew it had appeared the count sat on the sofa between two guests who were smoking and talking he neither smoked nor talked but bending his head first to one side and then to the other watched the smokers with evident pleasure and listened to the conversation of his two neighbors whom he egged on against each other one of them was a sallow, clean-shaven civilian with a thin and wrinkled face, already growing old. Though he was dressed like a most fashionable young man, he sat with his legs up on the sofa as if quite at home, and having stuck an amber mouthpiece far into his mouth, was inhaling the smoke spasmodically and screwing up his eyes. This was an old bachelor, a shinjin, a cousin of the countess, a man with a sharp tongue, as they said in Moscow society he seemed to be condescending to his companion the latter a fresh rosy officer of the guards irreproachably washed brushed and buttoned held his pipe in the middle of his mouth and with red lips gently inhaled the smoke letting it escape from his handsome mouth in rings this was lieutenant berg an officer in the semenov regiment with whom varus was to travel to join the army and about whom natasha had teased her eldest sister vera speaking of Berg, as it intended. The Count sat between them, and listened attentively. His favorite occupation when not playing Boston, a card game, he was very fond of, was that of listener, especially when he succeeded in setting two loquacious talkers at one another. Well then, old chap, Montre Honorable Alphonse Karlovitch, said Shinjin, laughing ironically and mixing the most ordinary Russian expressions with the choicest French phrases, which was a peculiarity of his speech. Vous comblez vous faire de l'insolite. You expect to make an income out of the government? You want to make something out of your company? No, Peter Nikolaevich. I only want to show that in the cavalry the advantages are far less than in the infantry. Just consider my own position now, Peter Nikolaevich. Berg always spoke quietly, politely, and with great precision. His conversation always related entirely to himself. He would remain calm and silent when the talk related to any topic that had no direct bearing on himself. He could remain silent for hours without being at all put out of countenance himself or making others uncomfortable. But as soon as the conversation concerned himself, he would begin to talk circumstantially and with evident satisfaction consider my position peter nikolaevich were i in the cavalry i should get not more than two hundred roubles every four months even with the rank of lieutenant but as it is i receive two hundred and thirty said he looking at jinjin and the count with a joyful pleasant smile as if it were obvious to him that his success must always be the chief desire of every one else. Besides that, Peter Nikolaevich, by exchanging into the guards I shall be in a more prominent position, continued Berg, and vacancies occur much more frequently in the foot guards. Then just think what can be done with two hundred and thirty roubles. I even managed to put a little aside and to send something to my father. He went on, emitting a smoke ring the balance he est so that squares matters a german knows how to skin a flint as the proverb says remarked shinjin moving his pipe to the other side of his mouth and winking at the count the count burst out laughing 
The other guests, seeing that Jin Jin was talking, came up to listen. Berg, oblivious of irony or indifference, continued to explain how by exchanging into the guards he had already gained a step on his old comrades of the cadet corps, how in wartime the company commander might get killed and he, as senior in the company, might easily succeed to the post, how popular he was with every one in the regiment and how satisfied his father was with him. Berg evidently enjoyed narrating all this and did not seem to suspect that others, too, might have their own interests. But all he said was so prettily sedate, and the naivete of his youthful egotism was so obvious, that he disarmed his hearers. Well, my boy, you'll get along wherever you go, foot or horse. That I'll warrant, said Jin Jin, patting him on the shoulder and taking his feet off the sofa. Berg smiled joyously. The Count, by his guests, went into the drawing-room. It was just the moment before a big dinner, when the assembled guests, expecting the summons to Zaguska, avoid engaging in any long conversation, but think it necessary to move about and talk, in order to show that they are not at all impatient for their food. The host and hostess looked toward the door, and now and then glanced at one another, and the visitors tried to guess from these glances who or what they are waiting for. Some important relation who has not yet arrived, or a dish that is not yet ready. Pierre has just come at dinner time and was sitting awkwardly in the middle of the drawing room on the first chair he had come across, blocking the way for everyone. The countess tried to make him talk, but he went on naively looking around through his spectacles as if in search of somebody and answered all her questions in monosyllables. He was in the way and was the only one who did not notice the fact. Most of the guests, knowing of the affair with the bear, looked with curiosity at this big, stout, quiet man, wondering how such a clumsy, modest fellow could have played such a prank on a policeman. "'You have only lately arrived?' the countess asked him. "'Oui, madame,' replied he, looking around him. "'You have not yet seen my husband?' "'No, madame,' he smiled quite inappropriately. You have been in Paris recently, I believe. I suppose it's very interesting. Very interesting. The countess exchanged glances with Anna Mikhailovna. The latter understood that she was being asked to entertain this young man and sitting down beside him. She began to speak about his father, but he answered her as he had the countess only in monosyllables. The other guests were all conversing with one another. The Razumovskys, it was charming. You are very kind, Countess Apraxina, was heard on all sides. The Countess rose and went into the ballroom. Maria Dmitrievna, came her voice from there. Herself, came the answer in a rough voice, and Maria Dmitrievna entered the room. All the unmarried ladies, and even the married ones, except the very oldest, rose. Maria Dmitrievna paused at the door. Tall and stout, holding eye a fifty-year-old head with its gray curls, she stood surveying the guests and leisurely arranged her wide sleeves, as if rolling them up. Maria Dmitrievna always spoke in Russian. Health and happiness to her, whose name day we are keeping, and to her children, she said in her loud, full-toned voice, which drowned all others. Well, you old sinner, she went on, turning to the count who was kissing her hand. You're feeling dull in Moscow? I dare say. Nowhere to hunt with your dogs. And what is to be done, old man? Just see how these nestlings are growing up. And she pointed to the girls. You must look for husbands for them, whether you like it or not. Well, said she, how's my Cossack? Maria Dmitrievna always called Natasha a Cossack. And she stroked the child's arm as she came up fearless and gay to kiss her hand. I know she's a scamp of a girl, but I like her. She took a pair of pear-shaped ruby earrings from her huge reticule, and having given them to the rosy Natasha, who beamed with the pleasure of her saint's day fit, turned away at once and addressed herself to Pierre. Hey, friend, come here a bit, said she, assuming a soft, high tone of voice. Come here, my friend. And she ominously tucked up her sleeves still higher. Pierre approached looking at her in a childlike way through his spectacles. 
come nearer come nearer friend i used to be the only one to tell your father the truth when he was in favour and in your case it's my evident duty she paused all was silent expectant of what was to follow for this was clearly only a prelude a fine lad my word a fine lad his father lies on his deathbed and he amuses himself setting a policeman as dry to bear poor shame sir poor shame it would be better if you went to the war she turned away and gave her hand to the count who could hardly keep from laughing well i suppose it is time we were at table said maya dimitrina the count went in first with maya dimitrina the countess followed on the arm of a colonel of hussars a man of importance to them because nicholas was to go with him to the regiment then came anna mikhailovna with chin chin berg gave his arm to vera the smiling julie karagina went in with nicholas after them other couples followed filling the whole dining hall and last of all the children tutors and governesses followed singly the footmen began moving about chairs scraped the bands struck up in the gallery and the guests settled down in their places then the strains of the count's household band were replaced by the clatter of knives and forks the voices of visitors and the soft steps of the footmen at one end of the table sat the countess with maria dimitriva on her right and anna mikhailovna on her left the other lady visitors were farther down at the other end sat the count with the hussar colonel on his left and shinjin and the other male visitors on his right midway down the long table on one side sat the grown-up young people vera beside berg and pierre beside boris and on the other side the children tutors and governesses from behind the crystal decanters and fruit vases the count kept glancing at his wife and her tall cap with its light blue ribbons and busily filled his neighbor's glasses not neglecting his own the countess in turn without omitting her duties as hostess threw significant glances from behind the pineapples at her husband whose face and bald head seemed by their redness to contrast more than usual with his gray hair at the lady's end an even chatter of voices was heard all the time at the men's end the voices sounded louder and louder especially that of the colonel of hussars who growing more and more flushed ate and drank so much that the count held him up as a pattern to the other guests berg with tender smiles was saying to vera that love is not an earthly but a heavenly feeling boris was telling his new friend pierre who the guests were and exchanging glances with natasha who was sitting opposite pierre spoke little but examined the new faces and ate a great deal of the two soups he chose turtle with savoury patties and went on to the game without omitting a single dish or one of the wines these latter the butler thrust mysteriously forward wrapped in a napkin from behind the next man's shoulders and whispered dry madeira hungarian or rhine wine as the case might be of the four crystal glasses engraved with the count's monogram that stood before his plate pierre held out one at random and drank with enjoyment gazing with ever-increasing amiability at the other guests natasha who sat opposite was looking at boris as girls of thirteen look at the boy they are in love with and have just kissed for the first time sometimes that same look fell on pierre and that funny lively little girl's look made him inclined to laugh without knowing why nicholas sat at some distance from sonya beside julie karagina to whom he was again talking with the same involuntary smile Sonya wore a company smile, but was evidently tormented by jealousy. Now she turned pale, now blushed and strained every nerve to overhear what Nicholas and Julie were saying to one another. The governess kept looking round uneasily, as if preparing to resent any slight that might be put upon the children. The German tutor was trying to remember all the dishes, wines, and kinds of dessert in order to send a full description of the dinner to his people in germany and he felt greatly offended when the butler with a bottle wrapped in a napkin passed him by he frowned trying to appear as if he did not want any of that wine 
but was mortified because no one would understand that it was not to quench his thirst or from greediness that he wanted it but simply from a conscientious desire for knowledge end of chapter eighteen